know, itself um, was started by two Royal Navy, young, young Royal Navy officers um, who'd served in the Napoleonic Wars and started a shipbreaking company in London and um, eventually decided to see whether they could have their own ship or hire a ship and do trade themselves, which started off with the William Fawcett in about 1837. And um, it was called the Peninsula Company, that is the Iberian Peninsula. And they also managed to win the contract to carry the mails to the garrisons at, um, at Gibraltar, which was obviously a huge garrison in those days. Uh, these old sort of paddle steamers, highly inefficient, billowing smoke apart from their sails and so forth. And uh, that was really how the company started. Our p and during the most powerful part of when we were the Empire, um, which probably has one of the best known house flags in the world, wherever you go. The piano flag is still something which people know exactly what it is, and therefore what a flag also represents. Indeed, the um, slightly apocryphal um, story is how the word posh developed, as you, as you know, is going through the Suez Canal. Um, there's a wind there called the Khamsin, which is the hot winds from the desert. And uh, to have the cool side of the ship was the port side, port out. And coming home again, it was starboard out. Those cabins were the cooler ones, where therefore the expression of P-O-S-H, posh. Most of our ships, frankly, were what they call passenger cargo ships, what they call a liner ship for a specific reason, carrying their cargoes, working in ports where they did not have port equipment, so you had to use your own ships, cranes and derricks, etc., etc., in order to put it in and out. Um, but of course, there's a marvellous book called Cornhill to Cairo, which was written by Thackeray in 1843, when he went on one of our ships. And in it, what is rather fascinating about it, and of course his English is absolutely magnificent, um, really well to the identical ports to what some of the Mediterranean cruises they go to today. And it's interesting that when you get to a place like Alexandria, or to Jerusalem, or to Istanbul, is to, through his eyes, of what life was like then when they came alongside and stayed there for a few days, as to how they become today. And this, um, I couldn't advocate more strongly to get a copy and, and read it. We also came to the conclusion, which was before my time, um, to create which was started by an American company, but the British side was the, really the fastest off the block, which was the development of containerization, which was the container ship, together with that great 20-foot, now 40-foot container, which has totally, totally transformed global world trade. And it has, has had a huge effect on how the world operates. I think that also building up the ports division worldwide, um, which became crucial um, for the development of the world container trade, and therefore the ports that uh, one was able to acquire were dealing with the Politburo in China, or Red China as it was then, and the great ports in India that uh, the company's been involved in. These are all places that our ships used to go to, but because of the connections, it's not surprising that sometimes it led to, we might as well have ports there, because most shipping companies had facilities in these ports, and same as it in, in Hong Kong, and places of that nature. You know, you had your own warehouses. That became real estate. And when shipping changed, you said, well, what do we do with it? But you finish up really being part of a port. So gradually, the concept of saying, well, Let's do it for real and be involved in, in having different ports and operations right throughout the world. 
our company was involved, um, SIPMA was involved, many companies actually were involved on that from, uh, from all over Europe in, in transporting people down who wanted it to go on that front. And um, for many people after the war, it was a way of being able to um, start a new life. We were demobilizing, I mean, millions, I mean, people in different forms of war effort. And after the jubilant greetings, they became forgotten. No backup social security, new jobs, where from? So the atmosphere, the attitude of the time, when you do away with the so-called headlines, was what sort of life am I going to have in this country? Well, everything was complete comfort, as you've probably realised, because these were became ironclad ships, so there was no thing, nothing like air conditioning, etc. So you can imagine in very hot climates and hot seas, it was quite unbearable. In fact, a very large number of passengers used to sleep on deck. The real change really happened because p or the Peninsula and Oriental Steam Navigation Company, which is its real great name through history, which operated in 120 countries in all different areas and different fleets of ships, whether it was tankers or bulk carriers or whatever it might be. Um, the major change started really in the late 60s, when you got the development of the aircraft industry to the, to the extent that the 707, then moving into the 747 later on, was capable of doing long distance flights. Once that started, it was the beginning of the end of the passenger side of liner shipping. Because whereas people took it for granted, they would have to spend three weeks or six weeks um, traveling to Australia, whatever it might have been. This was now, oh, this was over now. So one got to a stage of saying, well, what, what is one going to do? We have ships now which are built for the liner trades, like a Canberra or any of the, or any of the p and fleet. Um, are they really ideal as cruise ships if you're looking through those eyes? And the answer is no. And first of all, because they were ships which had about three classes on board, first sort of, sort of a second and steerage, etc. Whereas the world was changing in, in its style and you started to have what I call one-class ships. But that was the key change. And when that happened, you really had to say, well, what other form of business could you use these ships for? And cruising and for p to see how ships like Canberra and our Princess ships, and we owned the Princess um, Company on the west coast of America, what we could do. And what was quite clear by the time I became part of the company when I took control in the 80s, is that if we're going to stay in it, we have to build ships. You can't expect people to give marvellous service in ageing ships which are not really created for that purpose. It's not fair, it doesn't matter how good your crew is, they can only give a certain service. So you had to invest in a major way, um, which is really what really happened on our front. So we started to build ships for that particular purpose, designed as a cruise ship and not as a cargo ship. The first proper cruise ship which was built was the Royal Princess. And that was built in, in Finland. And that was a ship which had about a thousand passengers. Um, and was very modern, very modern for its day. And that's when ships started to switch from being turbine ships to diesel electric, which made a great deal of difference in operational costs. But actually the design of the whole ship, I mean, basically from the point of view of the, of the passenger, and the comfort and the facilities on board the ship. It was designed for comfort. And, um, and of course that was the, as an actual fact, it was the first ship I was involved in in, in, in that period of my life, as, as, as a naming ceremony. I can't think how many I've done since then. And of course it was the very first ship, um, in fact one of the first outings which um, the late Princess Diana was part of 
And uh, when she was saying it, that she was quite nervous because it was the first time she'd been in a public uh, engagement without her husband. And I said, well, we're both learning together, ma'am. <laughs> and the ships got larger. And now, of course, when one thinks about the idea, 20 years ago, building a ship with 3,000, 3,500 passengers, you would have said, you must be mad. Yet here we are, we've got these great ships, huge facilities on board, which people seem to enjoy. And, um, and it's also, it's, it's opened it up to many millions who probably couldn't have, would never have afforded to go on a ship and probably never even thought it was appropriate that they should even consider it as a holiday. So it is quite special that people now can go to all different parts of the world, which would have been unbelievable 50 years ago. The company over the years has had a very close relationship with the royal family. And uh, so when it's come to ship namings, uh, in the present royal family, you've had the the Queen, obviously, and Princess Royal. And I suppose in a strange way, the history is so rich that the way one can do a great naming, uh, as we've done in different parts of the world, it seems very natural, whereas maybe for other companies, it would be right over the top. What I brought back to the company as well was creating the Commodore, the fleet. And when we created that role again, as somebody being the Commodore of the, of the piano fleet, um, I also brought back there being presented a piano sword. Of course, in the early 1900s, piano um, officers had swords. And if you're operating in the China Seas in the early 19th century, they weren't there just for fun, necessarily. And I had one of the original swords in my office, which went back to about 1836. And Wilkinson still had, the, um, still had all the dimensions and therefore produced swords for these occasions, which are exactly the same as one wears as a Navy sword, which I have myself. And that then became, that became something which became regular habit of presenting the sword either to a retiring Commodore or to the ship. We've always encouraged the um, godmothers, if you call them guys, I still call them, a, I think it's an American term, um, to be involved and to travel with the ship. And I've had the pleasure, my own wife has, uh, has, has named the ship. And uh, all three have our great performers in their in their own art area. Um, one is one of the great singers in world terms for many years. Great personality. And welcome to my ship. <laughs> I named this ship Adonia. May God bless her and all who sail in her. Dame Mirren is a superb actress and again has huge following here and in the States and has had again great success. I name this ship Ventura. May God bless her and all who sail in her. And here we go. Oh, oh my God! Yay! Um, Darcy Bustle who uh, I knew most of all since so she was 12 years old and she was at the ballet school. A delightful girl. I name the ship Azura. May God bless her and all who sail in her. So all, all those in their own way have been such splendid successes and great ambassadors for their own field are natural to my mind of being part of being, naming our great ships and continuing with their association.
and I think it's, uh, it's, it's special for the company and I like to think it's special for the ladies concerned as well. When you have a, a, a ship naming, obviously as uh, heading up the company, one is the, the host, and also having the links with the armed services, apart from the palace, one was able to have the bands for beating retreat, you know, it's giving it a colour and, and uh, excitement and history, which most companies probably wouldn't have the opportunity of being able to carry out the same work. Most of the people who've worked in P&O, and I suppose I, I take it as a personal pleasure myself, is that it's, it's, a, it's a great, venerable company that through 175 years has managed to deal with the shock absorbers of change through great historic changes, natural disasters, world wars, change in politics, and yet still sailing the seas more powerful than ever. For me, it's still a great pleasure being involved. It's, it's never the same when for nearly over 30 years you've been the executive head of something, you are, you are in a totally different role, you don't intervene. Um, <clears throat> I, when I'm involved in any part of it, I work very closely with David Dingle. And uh, I think David joined the company, I think from university, I think it was just about the time I took over <laughs> control. So we just, so we knew each other for many years. And with Carol Marlowe, who again, I had the, pl the pleasure of appointing to um, Swan Atlantic many years ago. So these people have become part of your lives. And uh, so on these sort of areas, particularly like the 175th, uh, they came and said, well, how does one see it and how one might be able to do it and arrange it? So together with the palace and Trinity House and Princess Royal and so forth, we've now got a program which um, hopefully will give people a great deal of pleasure. I think life always actually comes back to people. It's not like a building. A building could look rather lovely, but if it's empty, it's empty. And it, I think that also as you get older, life is much more people. So I suppose even like very recently, I went on board one of our ships, and um, in no time, various members of the crew came over and said, you won't remember me, sir, but I traveled with you 15 years ago. I was on this ship and I was on that ship. And you go down below and big, big grins and smiles. And fortunately, I'm, I'm good at faces, I'm lousy at names, but I can still whiz over and say, we sailed together, when was it? <laughs> and, you know, and, and that I find is really what it's about. I, I was very fortunate, I mean, to have a career like I've been involved in and I'm still involved in, in doing things which I enjoy, being in a position of authority, to have a good crack in making them happen and seeing that certain things have been successful and having large numbers of people who made their lives and given their service to the company, I think that's what it's all about.